Welcome, golf fans, pursuers of knowledge and the almighty dollar. This is your golf guru bringing you the 122nd U.S. Open at the Country Club. First off and foremost, thank you for stopping by. This is my Before the Lock show where I cover everything from ownership projections, whether we talk about any updated information from pressers. I'm also going to go into a deep analysis on the guys around 7,500 and down give you my top five cheapy plays that you might want to look at and we'll also look at some others and with all that said let's talk a little golf okay first I do want to announce the winners of my giveaway that I've had running for the last couple weeks for the U.S. Open this is where you had to tell me who was going to win the U.S. Open randomly going to select out of all those entries I had over I don't know about 125 entries so thank you very much for all your participation I appreciate that Okay, so the winners are Jim Steele, Hat on Backward, Joe Rustler, Eden to Huntley, and Rich Ritchie. Congratulations, you are winners. And what I need you guys to do is email me at dfsgolfguru at gmail.com. Send me your PayPal email address, and then I will PayPal over the $100. So again, I need you five to email me at dfsgolfguru at gmail, your PayPal email address. And also tell me what your name is, because sometimes when you send me the email, I don't know who you are. So you also tell me what your YouTube uh, username is. That would be very helpful. And give me your PayPal email address. Okay, so congratulations. I will ping all of you on YouTube to let you know you won, just in case you don't see this video. But I'm not going to chase you guys down to send you money. So I need your uh, PayPal email address. Okay, shifting gears back to the U.S. Open. And I watched a few pressers. Well, I actually watched all of them that were out last night and if you didn't get the chance uh the two out of them that i thought had the most interesting bits of information that we might want to glean from a dfs uh fantasy perspective is the first one was cam smith i already mentioned that uh, of course i picked him in my top 15 and his ownership we'll look at uh here shortly but what's the most unique thing about cam i mentioned that you know he's been off of the driver and even the putter uh he's you know not been where he typically is and i Blame a little bit of that on putt luck, as in a lot of lip outs. And long story short, uh, he has changed the driver. He's taken a half inch off the driver and also then, of course, had to do something with the head from a swing weight perspective to get it correct. But he says he's, you know, in, likes it. He's be able to hit the fairway finder more. So for me, it's just one more piece of information that makes me, you know, want to play cam. But a lot of it is from a large, I'm talking about the Millie Maker. I'm not talking about cash games. If you want to play secure, you know, don't put Cam in there. But if you are trying to win the outright, you're going to have to get dif different in some areas. And, you know, if Cam ends up winning this thing or even top five, uh, he could be a huge uh, differentiation play. So that's where I'm leaning. And then over to Colin Morikawa. What was most interesting about his, uh, you know, presser was that he came out and just admitted that his uh, approach and off the tee He's not hitting his five yard fade that he's used to. I think it was more about the approach because of five yards. This driver typically, of course, moves more than five yards to a fade, but I think it was more around the irons. And what's been going on is he's been hitting a slight draw. He called it a two yard draw. Um, and he's just like, hey, I I'm going to quit fighting it and I'm just going to use that. Now, if you play the game of golf, that's easier said than done, especially if you've been playing for years and your sight lines and how you visualize. So if, if you're attacking a pen and let's say you draw the ball, 10 yards, 15 yards on average, whatever it is, right? You might put it off the right edge of the green. And that's a whole different mindset now, instead of aiming left of the flag a little bit, now you're technically either aiming straight at it or depending where you're trying to shoot, depending on how the green is sloping and all that. Neither here or there, it gave me one more reason for me to go ahead and keep fading Morikawa and that's where I'm gonna stay. I was more around the putting and um, it was the big reason. But of course, I told you guys that I wasn't seeing his tee to green game where it was, um, I don't know, before the, I guess even the start of the season. I feel like his season so far since January clicked over has been a little underwhel uh, underwhelming, I guess uh, is the best way to put it. All right, so that's some information. If you did not watch the pressers, go check them out. Um, if you want to hear more on, from their own mouth on what they said about the two topics that I just discussed. Okay, so let's go jump over to Fantasy National and let's go do some analysis on the guys that are about 7,500 and below. 
I'm going to tell you who that I'm going with and then uh, also give you the honorable mentions. Okay, so I've jumped over to fantasynational.com and as always, I highly recommend these guys if you want to start doing your own research. Uh, they are just purely focused on the PGA golf, just so you know. And uh, I also want to state that you're going to see DraftKings pricing, but of course you can use these picks on any format that you're playing from a DFS, FanDuel, Yahoo, whatever it is. The information that we're looking at did not change from the pick side. I'm looking at the last 24 rounds of golf these guys played or six tournaments. I've got no filters turned on here to the left. And I've got about 15 guys identified that I was interested in at uh, 7,300 and below. So that usually I go 7,000 and below, but we've got a lot of value in guys that we want to get in at the very bottom of the 7,000 range. And not so much, you know, much further. Um, so I'll talk about that. The first guy that, you know, piqued my interest was Russ Henley. Now, you know, as always, if you guys have been with me for a while, I'm a Russ Henley truther. I believe in his game. Um, of course, almost won the Sony. Been waiting for this guy to break through. Of course, he had a really nice show in uh, last year at this event. I believe he ended up 13th. We'll check that out. But with all that said, nothing's changed on the model. Ball striking approach off the tee around the green and bogey avoidance are the key uh, what is pulling up my ranking here? Still seeing fairways gained over the last 24 rounds. And then over here, you've got recent results, past five tournaments they played in, how they done, and then tournament history. And I mentioned yesterday, and I'll mention it again, that uh, the 2021 is, for whatever reason, not showing up in Fantasy National, but I'll make sure that we get to see that. So, yeah, I'm all in on Russ is a play down here. I'm looking for when you get a little bit lower here, even though we've got some names, some bigger names, comparative, um, you know, he is so elite with his irons and he's a pretty good putter. Now, typically I like, you know, we always, he puts best on Bermuda, but he's not a bad putter all around. You can see the key things here is ball striking. He's 44th out of 156 guys, 11th on approach, 11th around the green. And you can see he hits fairways. Now the driver has been a little wayward, which you'll see here. And let's go click on Russ to dive a little deeper. But typically, that's not the fact. You can see over his last 12 months, uh, typically, he's very accurate with the driver, 68%. If a guy is over 60%, that is quite a bit above, you know, hits it about average 300 yards. That's plenty far. You can see on his splits, Bermuda is his best, again, over the past 12 months. But he's positive on all surfaces, which is pretty unique when you're down in this area. Uh, but you can see the putter has been letting him down. And the driver, you can see this little stint here. Um, he made up with it with irons and putting, but he's lately, if you don't take the PGA in, but if you take in the Wells Fargo and RBC, you know, the ball striking has not been the problem. It's been the putter. Now, again, he's also super streaky. I've seen this guy rattle off four or five birdies in a row. I'm not expecting that here, but he's also, like I said, a talent that I like at that price tag. And you can see, as I mentioned, if I remember correctly, I believe on Saturday, he was up, if not leading going into Saturday, but was up at the leaderboard. Uh, I also believe this was uh, the Richard Bland tournament, right, too, that he was up there. But he did fall back uh, on the weekend, and uh, but still ended up with a 13th, a 25th before that, and a 27th. And this one would have been Shinnecock, which was a really tough test uh, for U.S. Open. I believe that's what Kepka went one plus one over, and that would be Aaron Hills. So, anyways, made the last three cuts, had a 13th, a 25th, and a 27th. I mean... All that said, I don't know what else you could really ask for at 75 or sorry, $7,300. You can see right now projected ownership is around 8%, so not too bad. Um, you know, Harold Varner, I was kind of on and off on, and the reason why is I think he's going to be, as you see, pretty chalky at this price tag. You know, I kind of want to lean on the guys, not all, but, you know, guys that can score, that can be a little more aggressive. There is about four holes here that I think are your opportunities. I don't remember them off the top of my head, but... They're the short par fours. I believe one is five, I think 17. You know, you've got options. Now, of course, you know, Varner, typically he can get hot and then he can put some big numbers on the board. Hence what happened at the Charles Schwab, I believe it was, where he fell apart. Let's go take a look because I don't know. I want to look at his complete history. But you can see from a modeling perspective, he ranks 13th and everything that I'm looking for. You can see off the tee has been a little bit of an issue. Um, which is kind of odd. I would think of him as got some distance, in, but you can see he's just a hair below uh, 60%. Putter is typically what causes issues. He has been really good around the greens, which you're going to need that. He's also been really good with the irons. And at the RBC, he did gain three strokes with the driver. Was a little bit off on the previous three, but even at RBC where 
you could say there's a pretty good comparison. Smaller greens, a little bit tighter fairways. Uh, I do believe they had to rough up a little bit, if I remember correctly there. And uh, that's where he gained, you know, on Bermuda, five strokes, 5.4. And then lost five on those uh, at Southern Hills on the slopey kind of bent grass. So we'll have to see how that all plays out. Oh, and I did want to pull up for you. So he's only played in the U.S. Open twice. Um, we can, the Masters, he did what, played this year. He had a 23rd. I don't know if he's ever played in a, yep, played in the PGA. Made the cut four times. Best showing was a 29th. And then as he ever went across the pond of the Open twice, missed cut a 66. So just to give you a little peek at his uh, major record, let me, uh, I don't know if I did that for Russ Henley for you, but let me do that also. I showed you the U.S. Open, um, but we'll show that again just so we have it. So. Played it six times, made the cut four, but a real nice uh, showing over the last three. And then the Masters uh, made the cut, what, five out of six, and a lot of good showings there, 11th of 15th, uh, 30th recently, the PGA. Best showing was way back 2015, he had a 12th, and played it, what, uh, looks like about nine times, made the cut seven out of nine. So he's got some history, I guess, is all I'm trying to get to in majors and doing okay. The Open looks like his worst. Uh, played that seven times, made it cut three times. Best showing was a 20th. All right. So there's Russ, a uh, little bit on the, you know, on the course history when he plays in the majors. All right. I put Patrick Reed here. He's more of a bet. I, I bet him, uh, which I kind of stated in my preview show. You know, I'm kind of back and forth. Can he come out and do the things he needs from tee to green? We all know that typically... He has been very good with the putter and around the green. That's what uh, has gotten him the finishes he's had at the U.S. Open. But we click on him real quick. I just want to show you what he's done at the U.S. Open. If if you don't know, you know, he's had a lot of really good finishes. So he's played it uh, eight times, made the cut seven out of eight. And you can see, you know, 13th, a 4th, 14th, a 13th, a 19th. I mean, because it is we don't have to go low, but it's kind of a grinders mental tournament. Um, that's why I like Patrick Reed from a betting side. I will sprinkle him in depending on how many lineups I put in. And all these guys I'm mentioning probably will get in at least a lineup or two. It's the guys that I highlight, uh, my top five that will be in the majority of my lineups if I get down, which I'm pretty sure I'll get down in the 7,000 range. Uh, JR, I bring him up. He's gonna, I think he's going to be kind of chalky. Um, everybody's going to be excited about that Sunday round that he just put on at the RBC Canadian. For me, the last you know round that stood out in my brain um, was the Masters first round, and I believe that was 2020. Um, but I mean, the good news about Justin, right, is he's typically a really good putter. Um, he's got a lot of history in the majors, so you're not worried about him, you know, kind of choking up uh, at least when he's not trying to shoot a 59. But uh, yeah, I, I like Jr. I have no problems. I'll click on him for you real quick just so you can see his kind of major record. And also you can see what he's done. So he had this little kind of hiccup here back in the start of the season, even Pebble Beach, you know, not very good. And then uh, had a nice showing at Southern Hills, PGA Championship, then went and missed the cut at Charles Schwab, then had a fourth at the RBC. A lot of that, of course, was that crazy 60 he shot on Sunday, shot up the board. But you can see a lot of it was done with the putter. And I wanted to see that was his second best uh, putting week ever um next to back in at the pga in 2021 so funny enough like i said you can see where he's had some of his best outings have been some bigger name tournaments all right next guy that i was interested in was lonto griffin projected ownership is two percent so that's kind of interesting uh he's been making a ton of cuts his best showing was at wells fargo and if you remember that was at avondale farms a very good comparable course now i didn't go into because there were kind of one-offs a lot of the comparable courses which you just pull in one sample of data I like if I'm using a comparable course where the guys have played there at least four or five round or four or five tournaments. Um, and I just didn't really have that for this. So I didn't really go in and cherry pick, hey, okay, the Wells Fargo this year could be a good comparable. Um, but it is. I think it's a, it's a good one. And um, let's go take a look. I want to click on Lonto for you. So he's a little bit less than 60% driving accuracy, hits at 300. You know, pretty solid with the putter. You can see that here over his career of 97 tournaments. He has uh, gained with the putter on average. You can see that showing up here again. Um, 
kind of did a lot, saved it with the putter. You can see everything else was kind of horrific from a ball striking perspective at the PGA Championship. So as he made uh, five cuts in a row, he missed at RBC. He had a pretty good stretch here at the end of last year, start of the new year. Uh, miscut the players, which, you know, I don't remember if he was AM, PM, but, you know, that's never a shocker than Valspar, tough track. So if you're thinking Lanto, well, let me pull up while I'm here for you too. Um, he's played the U.S. Open three times, a 35th, a 43rd, and a miscut. So, you know, he's not a stranger to that. Of course, his only win, if I remember correct, is he had the Houston Open. That would have been at the C yeah, Golf Club of Houston. I wasn't sure if it was Memorial Park or that. So anyways, occasionally I'm just going to throw out, again, a notable mention. The guy has been really good, ball striking, and he's been scoring at times now. He kind of got a mixed bag here, a missed cut at the Charles Schwab, made the cut at the Memorial PGA. Of course, he had that win on a very easy course at the TPC Craig Ranch, and uh, of course, back-to-back winner there. But at Wells Fargo, again, a pretty good comparable course recently at T25. So no issues with KH Lee. Luke Liss of 7,000, I think I think it's a pretty good value. Um, I'll be curious where his projected ownership comes in. Again, you know, he had his uh, first PGA win at Torrey Pines, uh, where he actually, you know, gained with the putter. Uh, pretty, I don't know what, how much now off the top of my head, but it seemed like it's pretty significant. I mean, if he gains at all with the putter, yeah, almost four strokes. That's pretty huge for him. Uh, you can see he's gained in his last two events also, so that's what got me kind of interested. It's fun to see some of his best putting outings ever. So he's gained eight at the Quill Hollow, gained seven at the PGA. I'm trying to think of that was Beth Page. Yep, Beth Page Black, which also is not a terrible comparable course. Uh, again, I just didn't want to do the one-offs. Uh, his history here, which what might get people off. Let's take a look. I just want to confirm. Yeah, he's played the U.S. Open. Didn't play it the last couple of years, um, but has missed the cut the last three years, or the only three times he's played it. So that's what I think will get people off Luke List. But for what you're getting at 7,000, um you know has won on a very tough course been on the, been in the the pga for quite a while now he's just an elite ball striker it really comes down to the putter what is he going to do with that so i'm going to put some luke list in uh alex noren you know he's got a really good major history when it comes to like the open um not that bad here he's a fader of the ball i kind of talked about this if you're putting a lineup together with uh very accurate faders you know, you would think of like a Billy Horschel, a Daniel Berger, an Alex Noren. Um, Morikawa would come to mind, again, shorter but very accurate when he hit a fade. So I like Alex Noren again, so I might build a lineup with guys that, as I just kind of mentioned. Um, and he has, like I said, a pretty good track record in majors. Let me take a quick look at what he's been doing. So he's usually a very good putter, not bad around the green. Um, and not too bad off there. Let me see this accuracy. So 60%. So that's kind of bare men where I want to be. Again, I don't. I think we've maybe made a little more out of the rough than it's going to be. And what I mean by that is that if you're just off the fairway, it's not going to be as bad as if you're way off the fairway, you're going to have some major issues. But I think if you're just five yards off, you know, run off a bit. From what I've heard, it's not as penal as, uh, you know, maybe we thought earlier. Uh, kind of back on the Luke List front, Siwoo Kim, right? Just an amazing ball striker. Uh, actually, he's been putting pretty well. You can see he hits fairways, you know, he's been playing some good golf. Uh, 2017 at the U.S. Open, he had a T13. Let me see what he did last year because, again, it's not going to show. All right, U.S. Open. So he actually made the cut. He had a 40th at Torrey Pines. So, yeah, we'll see. I mean, Luke, just like a Luke List, it's very high volatility, but... I like Siwoo. I think uh, he could be a pretty solid play. Brian Harmon, I think, is one of the better plays, to be honest, for a $7,000 price tag. Um, he's been playing really solid golf. I know he's got that miscut at the Charles Schwab, but he, the guy does everything. And actually, I think it was his rookie season. Yeah, two, well, it wasn't his rookie season. But early on in his career, he had a chance to win this thing uh, and ended up uh, tied for second. And he also had a good showing, if I remember right, at the Masters when... Um, well, Hideki won? Let's go see. Make sure I'm keeping this. Yeah, 2021. He had a 12th. Um, so pretty good. I mean, that's a good showing for him. How about the PGA? Let's go look at some of these major. All right. So I'd say, I don't know, I'd give him a 50% out of that. Nothing great. He had a 13th a while back. 
Uh, let's go look at the U.S. Open. So this is what I think is interesting. 19th last year, 38th or 36th a second. So that's pretty solid. Made the cut four out of six times. And then what about across the pond? Last year at a 19th, which I believe that, that was just such a simple open uh, that Morikawa won last year. I just really didn't feel like that was like just playing golf on Sunday as far as I, I think. Uh, and a 26, and then he had some miscuts in there. So, anyways, I like Brian Harmon. He'll be a uh, majority. Of course, Adam Hadwin. Let's take a quick look at him. You know, okay. I think he had a little had a little stretch there. Uh, pretty accurate off the tee. I just want to go see. Yeah, it was right here. where he, At Valero Valspar, the players, we all kind of thought he might break through uh, for a win there. Of course, he does have a win at Valspar a while back. It's his only. And I'll pull up the U.S. Open for you just so you can see. Three out of the five, he's made the cut. Uh, made the cut of 40th is his best showing. But I like his game from the perspective of he's typically a pretty good putter. You can see really good around the greens over the last six tournaments against this field. Um, so, yeah, he couldn't be wrong. I, I mentioned Matthew Neesmith. I think he was my super long shot bet. You know, hopefully he can find that spark he had at the battle spar. But the guy is always, you know, the models always love him because he's just really good ball striker from – T to green, it's around the green and the putter, especially that can get that. If he if he goes off there, you know, you're good to go. Um, Arnaus, I put in here, of course, he plays the DP World Tour, you know, pops up over here on used to be WGC events or, you know, some majors. He's had, I don't have it in front of me. You can look at it on DraftKings. Um, and I, like I said, I barely followed the DP World Tour, but he's been having a good season. Um, pretty solid player. And, um, you know, you see he has... Some history in the majors. Let's go take a look. Let's be specific here. He doesn't have a whole lot of uh, things here, but yeah, we only got him. So U.S. Open 2019, which would that be Wingfoot? And then the PGA Championship recently, he had a 30th. So, you know, we don't have a ton of data on him, but he ha all I have is finishes over there, and uh, he's been doing pretty well. So if you wanted to take that kind of unique, um, you know, take the European guy, there you go. All right, the last two guys are just a quick notable mention. Uh, if you're down here, so now we know we're below the threshold of 7,000. Honestly, I probably won't play a lot below that. Uh, I'll probably try to stick maybe Brian Harmon or Adam Hadwin, maybe Neesmith, but those guys is probably my cutoff. So yeah, if you want to get really unique, Denny McCarthy, Chase Seifert, I think are guys that are really low. So if you're trying to build that really aggressive, heavy above, um, you know, with little stars and scrubs, these would be the guys that I'm most interested in. I mean, I'll give you just a quick, you can see Denny. Been a little better. I mentioned this. Of course, he's always been the best or the, one of the best putters on tour. You're not going to see that here. I apologize. I didn't pull putting in because these smaller greens, I'm not as concerned about that. Um, I'm more worried about getting on the green. And uh, you can see he's hitting fairways. The ball striking is not immaculate. You, can, you know, it states here. But it is better. His irons are a little better. Um, and you can see that made the last five cuts um let's go pull up just real quick a little bit on his so pretty accurate off tee just not very long but here's the issue so the last five tournaments you know the tee ball has been hurting him a bit but the irons have been okay of course the putter is where he makes his money and around the green which i think could be a pretty good fit for what we're looking here uh best showings with it, the honda still doesn't have a win on the pga yet so kind of you know that's a difficult track that wasn't too long ago did a lot with the putter around the green same thing Oh, I did say I'd pull up the uh, U.S. Open history. Yeah, he's only played twice, and it's been a long time. I don't think he's ever played at the Masters. A lot of these guys, when you get down here, played the PGA three times, made the cut all every time, best showings of 48. And then I don't know if he's ever went across the pond. Nope. All right, the last one's Chase Seifert. Again, you know, he's no tournament history as far as I remember in a major. Uh, I believe he's section qualified to get into this thing. and But he's just, he's a... I don't know, let's go take a look what he just did at the RBC Canadian Open. So you can see pretty accurate, not very long, but typically he's not bad. And you can see his last outing, it was just the putter was trash, um, but really good off the tee, good on approach, you know. So again, if you're taking a flyer, he's someone at the bare min price that I would think about putting in. Of course, there's all the other sectional qualifier guys and, you know, I'm just not going to mess with it. I'm going to take... If I'm going that low, I at least want a guy that is playing steady on the PGA Tour. 
making cuts. Let's go talk about projected ownership. Okay, so if we look up top here, we have a lot of data. So this should be pretty accurate. Again, I always say it could be one or 2% either way. We almost got 15,000 generated lineups. What does that mean? That it's not just people clicked on these guys like you see here with the star and said, oh, I like that guy. It's they literally, you know, dumped out their teams and put it into DraftKings or wherever. And what we're going to want to look at is this number right here is going to give you the best projected ownership. And coming off, no shocker, I think uh, I mentioned this, I was also going to pick Sunjay in my top 15 because I felt it was a really good value. What keeps me a little bit uh, okay with kind of fading him because of that high chalk is his putter. You know, um, it, it can come and go. Typically, I've noticed he's been better on Bermuda. But, um, yeah, so that is your number one chalky. Xander was one of my picks. If you see a star, that's one of my picks. Um, but I knew this was going to be chalk up here. I stated that on my picks. So you got, you know, Xander, Rory, you know, Larry, and then, you know, you got Rom, which I'm going to be fading just with the short game. Uh, I'm shocked that Max Homa is that high, but, you know, and, and Burns, I think Burns is a really good value. And I think Max is too for what you recent form and where their game is now evolved to. Um, you can't really judge them a year ago, just as no more you could judge Scotty Scheffler a year ago and say he was the same player. Tony Finau, I think everybody is looking at, hey, here goes Tony Finau, you know, getting the second place, uh, the runner-ups, and uh, he's back in form. I'm on that same bandwagon. Yeah, Fitzpatrick, of course, got a little bit of history. That's been talked about quite a bit. But been playing really good golf. Spieth's been playing great golf. If his putter pops, he could definitely win this thing. Will Z, one of my picks. Mito, then you got Corey Connors. JT, amazing enough. Uh, so if you're trying to pivot off that Rory chalk, he's, you know, a bit of a difference maker there. Davis Riley, Joaquin Neiman, Bradley, one of my picks. Uh, you got Berger, Shuffler, Cam Young. You can kind of see the I'm not going to go through all. I mean, Brian Harmon is up there, so a little bit chalky. I think people see what I just said. You got Varner's up there a bit. Cantlay, a lot of people are a little bit dis dissatisfied with his showings at some of the majors recently. Billy Holy got the win at the Memorial recently. Uh, Webb, that's a little bit shocking that Webb's even at 8.6, but it is what it is. My Russ Henley, 8.5, um, which that should be actually selected. Siwoo. Um, now let's get to some of the differentiators that I, uh, let's see, I want to kind of see the guys that I have. I think the, Jim Fuhrer could be a little interesting. I mean, he's not playing what he used to, but so Adam Hadwin would be out of all my picks. It looks like off top of my, I mean, maybe I don't have Seifert and those guys in, but yeah, they're not in. I apologize. But um, Adam Hadwin, is that only 3%? First Kepka. Now for me, this is, I get it. Believe you me. And I, I probably will regret this, but um, I don't know. I just have a feeling that he could come out and do something now. 8,700, if he, you know, was a little less, I think he would be quite a bit more chalky. But um, he's my differentiation play. Of course, I already talked about Cam Smith. Had a few of you guys ping me on YouTube comments, you know, asking me about what kind of percent should you put in line. I mean, it, it you know, it depends the game you're playing. If you're playing in that $15 Millie Maker with 200,000 entries, I, I'm all over it, man. I mean, you now if you're putting in 150 lineups, you know, you got to make your own decision there. I don't think I would probably build 100, but, you know, maybe 30% of the lineups, I guess I would put them in. Um, 40%, I don't know. Try to get, I mean, you're going to get weight over the field no matter what at 4.6, if that's the way it all bakes out. But these two guys right here, I, you know, if they do what they can do, um, could definitely shing up. Seamus Power, I think that's just a pricing thing, as in, you know, he's priced around other guys that people feel more secure with. Victor Hovland's also one of my picks, another nice differentiation play. So, you can see Luke List. Um, who else? There's Patrick Reed. Like I said, I don't think it's, you know, here's Colin Morikawa. That's kind of crazy that he's at 7%. But I think, you know, a lot of people are probably seeing and hearing what I'm seeing. And who knows, man? I mean, I will probably build a Morikawa. I always build the young gun lineup. Always the great ball strikers, but not maybe the greatest short game. So that'd be like a Will Z, Hovland, you know, throwing Cameron Young in that mix. I always put one of those together. Usually it looks really good on Thursday and then it's not so good come Sunday. All right. I think that's enough. It gives you a good understanding of where these guys are coming in at um, from an ownership perspective. Let's go talk weather. So as always, use WinFinder, especially if you're playing Showdown. But of course, even if you, I do believe right now there's a little edge from the AM-PM split. We'll, we'll go look at that and verify that's still true. 
Um, so I, you know, this was just pulled up again. I don't know, local time, 1147. Uh, you're going to want to pull up the Charles River Basin. For me, that was the closest location. There's not one right next to the course, but it's pretty close. And when you look at the super forecast for Thursday, you know, it's pretty, it looks pretty steady, kind of gusting. You don't look at like there's a big advantage. But it's funny when I looked at it from just a regular forecast for the two days that I'm focused on Thursday, Friday, um, you know, it's kind of showing quite a, quite a big difference. I mean, as in the gust factor. And of course, we all know typically the morning is calmer. You've got stupid ad. You've got, um, you know, fresh greens. Typically, the greens are going to be softer. There's a lot of reasons why, you you know, especially from a showdown perspective, that you're going to want to play the guys early in the morning. And there's a pretty nice set of guys to play. I talked about that on my preview show. And then if I scroll down, you can kind of see that weather showing that it sticks around and then supposedly it's going to calm down with possibly a little rain in the afternoon. So if you go with that, there could be a possible. So I'm going to build some lineups under that note um, and see if that all pans out like it, you know, kind of worked out in the players. So I don't know. We'll see. But uh, that is kind of the weather. I'm not going to even, you know, Saturday, you know, and Sunday, it, it is what it is, right? That's like three, four days out at this point. But Thursday, Friday, I mean, especially for tomorrow, at least we have a pretty good understanding. All right, let's jump back and wrap this thing up and get you guys out of here. Okay, so to summarize the top five cheapy plays that I'll be leaning on more than the other guys that I mentioned, but like I said, I'll sprinkle those other guys in here or there, depending on how the bill works out. Russ Henley, probably being quite a few, especially if I create that like all irons lineup. Um, I think, I, I believe he is still very elite. These small greens, you're going to need very accurate irons. Of course, you're going to need to hit the fairway. You're going to need to make putts. You're going to need to be good around the greens. But if you're hitting greens uh, more often than not, maybe, and even tighter to the pin, of course, not as good with the putt. You don't have to be as good with the putter. You don't have to be as good out of the sand or around these greens. So we'll see how that all plays out. But like I said, I like to build stack or s- skill set lineups you know, guys that are, uh, you know, typically score well, but are very streaky guys that are really good with the irons, um, guys that have history, um, you know, and like you could, you know, like a Rose Reed, you know, like that. So just again, skill set lineups, I built a few of those going to build some on the, as I mentioned, the uh, AM PM slot. So kind of smattered it around Harold Varner playing great golf. We'll see how that all pans out. I'm not going to lie. I was off and on on Harold Varner. Uh, so he probably won't make a ton of my lineups but uh and you asked why i just i just the guy just has too many big blow poles and on this course you know you're putting double bogeys up triple bogeys it's game over luke list we'll see if that that form keeps you know it's been kind of like he won at the farmers and his form kind of dipped and then it's kind of come back a little bit so hopefully it's back uh, i'm kind of interested in sprinkling him in a bit also when you're down here i like to take the guys that maybe you know have a little you know can offset birdies with some bogeys i feel luke does that pretty well See who Cam, I look at him as an all-around good game, but it's just, what is that putter going to do? Uh, really good ball striker. He actually has pretty good around the re- around the green game. Um, is typically the putter, as with a lot of guys, especially down at the lower areas. And last but not least, maybe which showed by ownership, um, I think everybody sees what, you know, has a, a pretty strong pedigree in the majors, has a game set that could fit this course. You know, I, I would put him a little bit as like a, the Bulldog, Kevin Kisner, Patrick Reed, that – he will grind out rounds. You need to be able to do that at the U.S. Open. So no shocker that he's probably the highest own ownership projected uh, out of my cheapy plays. Real quick, if you are in one and done and you're interested in who to play or, you know, my thoughts on it, I, I mentioned this yesterday, but I'm going to bring it up again. This is the real quickly. You can look at the guys, any just the U.S. Opens, of course, on all different courses. Uh, but what they've done in the last five years, you could also say USGA typically sets a course up. Uh, you know, very typical, the, the high, rough, you know, very difficult. Test all skills. So uh, Kepka, of course, leads it, you know, hands down, total strokes gained over those last five years. You know, Louis, but I just think his game is not near where it was the previous year. I could be totally wrong. Of course, he's had excellent showings at the U.S. Open and even in majors. Uh, Xander, Matt, Casey, Reed, DJ, Rom, you can see the rest. Brian Harmon actually shows up there. We were just talking about him. And the guys that I'm looking at, I'm, you know, this is, you know, funny enough, I don't think, at least I have not seen what the purse is uh, for this event. It has not been been announced, but of course we know, it, you know, I would guess minimum uh, a, a mil and a half, but I would guess somewhere around two, two plus million for the winner, which is a big changer on moving up and down within your one and done. So, of course, you're going to want to use 
the best guys you have available. So your top 10 players uh, for me right now, that's Xander, JT, and I've spent the other three already. Um, but of course, you know, you could look at a Tony Finau I mentioned, you know, Will Z, um, you know, Finau. It's all depending where you're at. You know, if you need, a, you know, a unique guy to win this thing, then you need to go a little off target to get move up because we don't have you know, what, six tournaments left, something like that, one and done. Yeah, we got like one more major, the FedEx, and then, yeah, with the Travelers and a few, couple in between there. So, yeah, we got to, if you need to make the move, you got to get a little unique. All right, well, that said, that is going to wrap up my uh, U.S. Open shows. I am super excited. I've been watching all the coverage, as I'm guessing you probably have too. And if you would do me the honor, as always, click that like button, share this with anybody else that you would know for some odd reason that would be interested in and all this great amount am- all this great, amazing information on fantasy golf. And if you're not a subscriber, for some reason, you need to hit that subscribe button. I put out three shows every week, helping you get an edge on the rest of the folks out there playing fantasy golf. And last but not least, follow me on Twitter. I always update anything from the PGA Tour regarding withdrawals and whatnot or weather or whatever you guys need to know. It'll be there on Twitter. All right, guys, have an amazing weekend. Enjoy the golf. I'm excited to see how this all works out. And uh, I'll talk to you guys on Monday.